Mm -hmm. I, I just want to uh, to say welcome again, uh, welcome back to the to this uh, uh, tea breaks uh, uh, seminars of the GGI after the, the the break of the Easter vacation, and uh, it's. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Renato Renner with us. Uh, Alessandro will introduce him. Let me also say that on our webpage, uh, you can have a look of the list of uh, next seminars. Uh, the schedule is almost set up from here to summer, so stay tuned and uh, thanks again. Alessandro, please uh, go ahead. Th thank you very much, Stefania. And uh, indeed, welcome back to everybody after the break. And welcome in particular to our speaker for today, Renato Renna. Renato is a professor of theoretical physics at ETH Zurich. And in particular, he works on the area of quantum information broadly intended. He did important contributions to the field of quantum information, in particular quantum cryptography. But also recently, he did very interesting work in the field of the foundations of quantum mechanics itself. In particular, one work which uh, uh, attracted much interest and is very thought-provoking is uh, um, a work that he did with Daniela Frauchiger uh, just a couple of years ago on, if we wish, a paradox of a quantum uh, of the quantum theory. And this goes to show that uh, these ideas of sort of testing a quantum theory and trying to come up with those experiments, which was certainly very popular at the beginning of the life of quantum mechanics, can still give uh, at least many surprises and many good uh, starts for discussions. I think I don't want to say too much about this because I'm sure that Renato will have more to say in the talk. So I think that without further ado, uh, I would leave the floor to him. I, just ask, I would just like to say that uh, in order to keep things a little bit lively, if you have a question during the talk, please raise your hand. We will uh, try to uh, let, let you ask the question, but in order not to uh, you know, derail too much the talk, perhaps uh, uh, we can do this for questions that are more related to a specific point that is being discussed in the talk, something that is perhaps unclear, whereas the more general discussions, which I'm sure will be plenty, with, that we can keep for the end of the talk. Okay. That being said, uh, please, Renato, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Alessandro. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to talk um, in this seminar. Uh, it would, of course, be much nicer to actually be in Italy, but I hope that will be possible again relatively soon. So as Alessandro said, I will actually talk about a kind of specific sort experiment. The title is maybe more general. It's about sort experiments, but I will focus a bit on one on the one that Alessandro mentioned that we proposed actually um, three years ago and which has indeed, indeed caused a lot of discussion and I hope it will the talk will similarly be a bit thought provoking and um, that we will have an interesting discussion towards the end. Okay so incidentally I don't know whether you have noticed this but today is also the so-called world quantum day I guess in the meantime there are special days for almost everything. And um, there's also for quantum. And um, I'm not sure whether Alessandro timed the event um, with that day, but um, it's certainly a day which somehow um, celebrates in, in a certain way, the fact that we are now able um, not only to understand quantum mechanics, but to also use it for applications. And so this quantum day is also devoted um, to make people aware of the technological applications. However, um, the success of quantum theory, or maybe we could even say quantum theory is kind of a victim of its success, because we had so many applications that people for some time, in particular after, let's say, the Second World War, stopped to really ask questions about its own foundations. And by foundations, I mean in particular the question about what is really the range of validity of quantum theory. And to briefly come back um, to this technology, I'm sure you have seen the news, um, I think it's almost now two years ago, that Google had a processor 
and with qubits, I think there are 53 qubits where they claim that this is the first time that we can do a task on a quantum device that is um, um, that cannot efficiently or not in a reasonable time be executed by a classical computer. Now, for me, experiments towards building quantum computers have actually, um, apart from all these applications, which are certainly promising, and hopefully, at least if you get good um, also quantum software, apart from that, there is really this interest that quantum computers somehow test quantum theory in a regime of more and more complex systems. So just taking this perspective, I could say that this experiment by Google and now also many others actually shows that even relatively complex systems, systems that are so complex that we cannot simulate them classically, show um, the behavior of quantum mechanics that was predicted. So there is essentially no deviation from the experiment and uh, between theory and the experiment. But now as we scale things up, the goal is to have millions of qubits, we have to also ask the question, is it really true that quantum mechanics still describes correctly large systems? And building quantum computers is an experimental test for that assumption that quantum mechanics doesn't stop to hold true when we go to um, systems with millions of qubits. But of course, it's not clear that there is never we will never reach a boundary. And this now relates back to an old question, the a question that was already raised by um, very early in the development of quantum theory, for example, by Erwin Schrödinger. And um, this is, of course, famously known by the Schrödinger cat, which essentially just illustrates the strange consequences that we would see, or maybe not see, but at least have, if quantum mechanics was valid also on macroscopic scales. Actually, I'm, I'm showing this really proud of that picture, which I took myself because um, in the place where I lived until recently, um, um, which is this, this street, Huttenstrasse, I realized um, is also a house where Schrödinger lived. And now um, they um, put this little metal cat in front of the house. And um, it's actually claimed that depending on the light condition, it looks dead or alive. I think now it looks quite alive. And um, uh, I mean, it's maybe worth if, if you're once in Zurich to go to um, this place just to see this cat. I mean, I think it's more the atmosphere to think that this was maybe the real Schrödinger cat, at least it's the one close to his house. Anyway, the, uh, we could even go further in the question and ask ourselves, is quantum theory really a, giving us a correct description of astronomical or cosmological um, on, cosmo on sizes where we do cosmology? And this is at least assumed by um, many people. And it's now, at least in my field, in quantum information, very popular to study the so-called black hole information paradox. And this paradox arises when we assume that even the evolution of an entire black hole is, um, on the, is actually correctly described by the Schrödinger equation and is therefore unitary in a certain sense, or in principle reversible. So now we could ask ourselves, what do we really know already? And what is certainly true is that we have tested quantum theory in the regime of small systems. And I don't want to define here what I mean by small. Maybe I could just define it. I mean, maybe another expression which would be more accurate is we have tested it on systems which can be very well isolated from the environment, from env environmental influences. And this is typically, of course, true for small systems but not necessarily. We have also certain tests of quantum theory to actually surprisingly, in, in some sense, or remarkably large systems. There are people who do double slit experiments with rather big molecules and still see a quantum behavior. So we have no reason to assume that quantum theory is not a correct um, description of nature and actually an extremely accurate one in addition, because many of these experiments show agreement with the theory to very high precision as probably most of you know very well. But then when we really talk about actual macroscopic objects, I mean, of the size of cats that we had before, then we simply don't know. We have no experiment that shows that a, an object of the complexity of a cat can be in a superposition state and um, would show the corresponding behavior that we would then 
half if, if this was the correct description. We simply cannot do these experiments because um, of what I said before, it's very hard to isolate the system from environmental influences. And to see a superposition of a dead and alive cat, I would need to make sure that not a single um, kind of piece of information in, in information theoretic sense, but maybe physically speaking, a single atom or photon <clears throat> which describes, which contains information whether a cat is alive or dead doesn't lead to, to some uncontrollable degree of freedom. And so that's obviously very far away. And it's of course even less likely that we can do experiments showing the quantum behavior of black holes directly. Although um, I see that even, I mean, I even got emails from people in, in the audience here that they're studying quantum mechanics on cosmological scales. And I think this is extremely important to do because that will really give us also the picture from um, from that um, direction. So usually I, I start from the microscopic one and go to the large one, but um, this is really a big open area. Now I'm not an experimentalist and I'm trying nevertheless to work on this question because I think it's an important question to understand where is quantum mechanics valid and where not. And as a theorist, I use the tools of theorists and, and one of the tools we have are thought experiments. So we are trying essentially to understand what would be the implications if quantum theory was valid on larger scales and could we from these implications draw certain conclusions? Could we even see certain things that wouldn't be as expected or contradict certain other facts and from that we may then conclude that there is some boundary and beyond which quantum theory is no longer possible. So that's kind of the general aim. And of course, that's a big goal. And I don't think anyone has um, yet really an idea of what happens in this area. But um, I try with my work to get some insights, some little pieces of information of what happens in this big red area where we don't know. Now, the approach I'm taking, as Alessandro said, I mean, information, a quantum information series, and I'm calling the whole approach or the ideas or some of the ideas behind my work information theoretic and what do I mean by that of course information is a very um, big or vague term by itself but one aspect of information theory is that we don't usually in information theory study just the objects that we are interested in but we are studying the information someone has about an object so in this particular picture of course, um, we have, for example, a system, a quantum system, called it here R. And now we are not in information theory, we're not only studying the system R, but we are also studying someone who has information about the system R. And this is indicated by this little bubble. So there is some um, someone I call this an agent who has information about that system. And that's usually, of course, us who are thinking about the system. And then you can ask the question, how much information can we possibly have? about the quantum system. Are there any bounds to that? And for example, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is in a way a bound on the amount of at least classical information that we can have about the quantum system. Now, the, that maybe doesn't show as much. I mean, of course you could say that's just a detour to ask ourselves what information do we have about the system if you are actually interested in the system. But there's one additional thing we can do, we can now Kind of do a recursive reasoning. We can now say, let's now promote this agent who is a priori was, was just had the role of carrying information about the system. So it was, I mean, you could even think more abstractly, it doesn't have to be a human, it could be some other system that carries information about the system R. We could now say, let's now promote this information carrying system itself to an object that we want to study and ask ourselves how much information can we have about this joint system consisting of A, A is the agent, and R. So in pictures, this means that we have now a second agent. Let's call him Wigner. And it will probably later become clear why I call this person Wigner. Wigner is now, have, is now a reasoning or has information about the system, which consists of the agent A. Let's call her Alice. 
and another system about which Alice is reasoning. So we have kind of a nested setting. Alice is kind of carrying information about R and Wigner is carrying information about Alice who's carrying information about this little spin system. And this approach, this general way of thinking about agents having information about others will be important for what I'm going to say later. Maybe at the moment it's not yet clear what, how this can possibly be useful, but this is really what information theorists do in their daily life. They ask themselves, what, how can different information about the same piece of information be compatible, for example, and how can we convey information and so on. So um, the basic idea behind the thought experiments that I want to propose is really to ask or to use this fact that in principle, a theory that is claimed to be universal. So if you assume that quantum theory is universal, then the theory should be allow us to describe other systems or any system in the world. And this other system could itself be an agent who is using quantum theory. So some people usually think this is a bit um, in the style of Gödel type statements. We are somehow doing a nested reasoning. So we are using quantum theory to describe systems that can themselves be users of the theory. Now this sounds maybe still very vague and I'm trying, I will try to make this a bit more precise. And actually at the end, I, I really want to make it precise enough so that one can see that this is not in some way a vague, sometimes a um, philosophical statement, but it's more a physics statement with a, um, actually a, um, a claim that could in principle be falsified by real experiments. Now one could, I mean, one question that always comes up when one talks about the validity of quantum theory is the following. If we know that quantum theory is a perfectly valid theory on the level of atoms, one could say that ultimately everything consists of atoms. Of course, there's also gravity becoming relevant, but let's say if I only go to um, systems of the size of humans, then um, um, they just consist of atoms. And if every atom of the human is correctly described by quantum theory, why isn't the whole human correctly described by quantum theory or the cat or whatever? Now I want to make this an agent. So uh, that's why I had this human picture. Here. And um, indeed, if one thinks in that way, there, there would be no natural boundary. I mean, uh, why should there be a threshold beyond which quantum theory is simply no longer valid? However, there is really a conceptual distinction. If we are talking about small systems, and now I call small systems which have a very low complexity, then these systems can certainly not by themselves take the role to be users of the theory. So an atom cannot itself make calculations and make predictions in physics but a human can. So there is somehow a difference that we have systems that are themselves possible. I mean, they're complex enough to somehow use quantum theory themselves and make predictions. And that's certainly what humans can. That's why on this scale, this blue part starts at the scale of humans at the least. Okay, so let me briefly go back again to history and um, just say a few things that were um, came up in the development of quantum theory. Of course, this type of question about can an, a user of the theory, like Alice from the previous picture, itself be described by quantum theory is again a very old question. It was actually raised by Wigner and that's why I called this person Wigner. So Wigner um, proposed um, a thought experiment where he said, let's put a friend, I mean, this is Wigner's, this is why it's called Wigner's friend experiment. Let's see this person that I call Alice in a perfectly isolated box. So this is indicated by this black line. Now, as I said, it's a thought experiment. I don't want to claim that we can in reality um, perfectly isolate the box, but let's just assume that this exists. At least the theory itself maybe doesn't ex exclude it. And now let's suppose within that box, this little Alice carries out the measurement. So for example, one could say this is a spin system, a particle R that has a certain spin, could be 
up, for example, that's indicated here, or it could be down. And then she carries a measurement with respect to the up-down basis. But now the special thing about the Wigner-Sort experiment is that Wigner now describes the situation from the outside, and he doesn't only describe this particle within quantum theory, but Wigner is, um, tries to describe the entire content of this isolated box as a big quantum system. So what Wigner does is, I mean, he doesn't only associate the state to this little particle, but he also associates a quantum state to, for example, this um, observer, this agent here. And let's assume just for simplicity, otherwise I would have to write the longer formulas that this measurement device is also part of A. So now the idea is that we can say initially before Ali starts the measurement, um, the situation, the, the quantum state of this box um, could be prepared in a pure state. That's again a very um, strong assumption, but that was just the idea that we can propose. So uh, these particles, for example, in the spin-up state and Alice together with the measurement device is in some state that is the state um, that she would have before she starts to measure. I called it the ready state. It's before you, when you're ready to measure. And then you just consider the evolution that happens in this system. And of course, if this measurement device does what it's supposed to do and measures in the up-down basis, if the state was up, then the final state of the box will be that um, the particle, if it's a non-destructive measurement, that the particle still is in the up um, position and the measurement device um, shows up and Alice knows that she observed up. So it could, um, this is indicating what Alice now thinks after she does the measurement. Now, the important point is that if the box is isolated and if the state initially was pure of everything in the lab, then it will still be a pure state after this evolution. And of course, I could now say everything what I said with a down um, particle that we start. And of course, then the final situation will be that if it's non-destructive, the particle still points downwards and Alice has measured down. Now, Wigner's um, kind of experiment is now interesting because he considers, instead of a preparation of an up or down particle, a particle that is prepared, for example, in the spin right direction. And I could just by convention say, this should be um, an equal superposition of up and down. Now the question is, I mean, I will just now drop um, normalization factors to make this formula not look too ugly. So we now have a similar situation as before as a starting point. So the particle is prepared in this superposition of up and down and the agent, Alice, is ready to measure it. And now the question is what comes out of that? And that was the question Wigner asked himself. And now his, um, the remark he makes in one of his famous papers, actually called Remarks about the mind-body problem, he um, says that if you really take quantum theory at face value and, and um, assume that this is, as I said before, a perfectly isolated box, then the evolution according to quantum theory has to be a linear um, is described by a linear operator. So therefore, we can just take this, uh, we can, we already know what happens if it's an up particle, we know what happens if it's a down particle. So we can just add the two situations and that's what comes out. So his conclusion was that if quantum theory was applicable to this situation, we would end up in a superposition state consisting of Alice having observed up and the particle being up in the other direction. Okay, so that was, Wigner sort experiment that probably many of you are already familiar with. So I'm sorry if I took a bit too long for that, but I wanted to make sure that those who may not have seen it know what this is. Now, Wigner's conclusion at that time was that this cannot be. So he essentially said this would mean that Alice doesn't actually see an outcome. He called it, it's a kind of state of suspended animation of Alice. She just doesn't see an outcome. She's somehow in a strange, um, uh, um, yeah, kind of, I could say, very cloudy type of state. The question is, of course, how you interpre interpret that. But the beginner said this simply doesn't make sense. And he concluded from that that quantum theory is not applicable if you have humans in the box. That is, of course, a, a view that actually he himself no longer had um, later. 
because it kind of brought in the aspect that some there's a human. I mean, it somehow meant humans make a difference to physics. It, it may, physics is different depending on whether there's a human in the box or not, and that's. Um, I mean, that may, of course, be true, but that would be very hard to make um, precise because we don't know what really makes a human compared to another object. Of course, we know it very well intuitively, but not in terms of physics. But one, it's maybe fair to say that experiments like Wigner's friend experiment and also Schrödinger's cat experiment, which is very similar, instead of the friend, you have the cat, and it's a more, bit more brutal in a way because the cat either dies or not, whereas the friend just looks at an outcome. But it's fair to say that this experiment has maybe given, was kind of a starting point of many um, interpretations of quantum theory. So one could maybe phrase it differently and say, even today, people don't agree on what this experiment really tells us. And the reason why I can confidently say that physicists don't agree is simply that there are many so-called interpretations of quantum theory and the claims they make about what this experiment does are extremely different. Let me um, not go through all of them, but just um, kind of illustrate what I mean. So you could go back to this picture and ask yourself, what does Alice actually really see? If you only take Alice's perspective. Now, a reasonable thing to say is that Alice for Alice, it shouldn't make a difference whether or not she's in an isolated box. Of course, it makes a difference that she cannot go out. But I mean, if you ask the question, does she see a measurement outcome or not, this shouldn't make a difference. So we could say it's reasonable to assume that from Alice's perspective, there is still just one measurement outcome she sees. I mean, we know that this happens, that if you measure something, you see an outcome. But then, so that's Alice's claim, that Alice sees an outcome. But Wigner? could say, no, I concluded by my calculation from quantum theory that Alice is in a superposition. So we have two claims. Okay, I called it here Bob. That's actually a mistake. It should be called Wigner's claim. So Alice's claim is, I observed either up or she claims I observed down if we carry out this experiment. And Wigner, here called Bob, um, says, no, Alice is in a superposition with being having observed up and down. That's what we just saw if we apply quantum theory. And now this table shows somehow in which interpretation, which of these claims is supposed or is deemed to be correct. So there's, for example, this um, quite old by now Copenhagen interpretation where people would say, oh, clearly Alice is right. She sees an up and down and Bob is not right because he made a mistake. Bob shouldn't treat Alice as a quantum system. Alice is a macroscopic system and quantum theory is not supposed to correctly describe macroscopic systems. There are also, for example, collapse theories. For example, maybe um, in particular in Italy, well-known GRW theory, which would claim the same. They would say there's just the deco inherent decoherence. Even if you have an isolated box, there's decoherence. And this will result in Alice um, collapsing essentially into either that state or that. And Bob's claim here that there is a superposition must be wrong. But there are also um, other interpretations, actually more recent ones called cubism, for example, or relational quantum mechanics. This is the, uh, um, the interpretation um, promoted by um, Carlo Rovelli, for example, or Bohmian mechanics. And they, interestingly, all make, I mean, they're different, but they all make the same claim about the experiment, namely that both are right. They somehow try to come up with a view on quantum mechanics that makes both statements valid at the same time. And that's, um, I mean, they do, they do this in different ways. For example, in cubism, they just say it's, and also in the relational quantum mechanics, they say it's okay if a statement is just true for one person, we shouldn't compare them. So Alice should still not compare this statement to that. They're all, everything is relative, including the statements we are making. And that's a very strong point also made by Carlo Rovelli, for example, in, in his motivation for relational quantum mechanics. In Bohmian mechanics, it's different. There, people say there is just, quantum mechanics is just one layer, but there is also an additional hidden variable. It's not called like that, but that's Bell's term for that, which tells us where it is. So according to, to the formalism of Bohmian mechanics, there is indeed a quantum state, and this quantum state after the execution of the experiment is in a superposition between up and down. 
So there, if I go once again back, Bohmian mechanics would say that's the correct quantum state. However, there is an additional variable, some classical um, value out there in the world, which tells us which of these two so-called branches is the real one. So there's just one other piece somehow, an, an additional state of the system, if you want, which tells us it's, okay, this is the quantum state, but actually she observed up. So then of course you could say it's still true that there's this superposition, but this doesn't mean, this doesn't contradict that one of these was true because this additional classical value tells us which of these is true. And of course, um, many worlds that is well known, but maybe not very precisely phrased, would somehow say, no, this is not true here. Alice, there should be an and here. And indeed, um, Wigner is right, there's a superposition, but for Alice, it means she just sees both. She's maybe not aware of it, but um, there are kind of two copies of Alice. Okay, this is all just to illustrate and to make clear that we are far from having an agreement among physicists of what how to make sense of Wigner's friend sort experiment. Uh, Renato, yes, I think we have a question. Maybe we can yes. take it. I will unmute uh, uh, Sebastian mm -hmm. and he can ask a question. Please, yes. Oh, hello. This is Hi. Sebastian David from Indiana University. Hello. Uh, so, so I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm being naive in my understa understanding of the Copenhagen interpretation. So, so I'll make a claim and please find a mistake and correct. Uh, so, so looking at the first, first row uh, where, where you claim that within Copenhagen interpretation, Alice is right and Bob is not right. If you go to the previous slide with these wave functions, mm -hmm. yes. As I understand Copenhagen interpretation, maybe I'm wrong here. This wave function that we have on the bottom is the wave function that Bob or Wigner yes. uses to describe this, this joint system, Alice and the spin. Mm -hmm. uh, and he sees this, this superposition, but as I understand within the Copenhagen interpretation, this superposition means, or this, this state is, is, or should be interpreted as a state of Wigner's knowledge. So this is what Wigner oh. knows about this system. Therefore, Wigner basically knows that this system is either in this state or in this state, yes. which is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot for bringing this point up. Actually, um, I, I mean, you're right in what you're saying, but um, I should actually have put two um, rows in this table. There are, I mean, Copenhagen is kind of not by itself a well-defined um, interpretation. And there is something that people today call Neo-Copenhagen. And um, this is a theory that is actually um, by many people who, do, who work on foundations, for example, my friend in Austria, Czaslav Bruckner, he would say he's, he's a neo, as far as I understand, neo-Copenhagenist, he would exactly make the statement you made. So in Neo-Copenhagen, the row would have the two um, marks here, um, like for example, cubism, exactly for the reason you said, because in Neo-Copenhagen, one would say everything is just should be interpreted as a, the knowledge that someone has, and then there is no problem. So in that sense, it's perfectly right what you're saying. However, there is also, um, let's say now, because uh, I mean, the name Neo Copenhagen already um, probably makes clear that there is also, an, let's say, more traditional Copenhagen interpretation. And according to that, we have to once and for all say which systems are kind of macroscopic and which are not, and we are not supposed to assign um, a state, a quantum state to systems that are macroscopic. And once we are saying that the system is able to do a measurement, and Alice is able to do a measurement, we have to treat Alice as a macroscopic system. So um, one could call that maybe the old Copenhagen interpretation, although I wouldn't use this term because there are many people I know well and, and, and um, think highly of them who still think that this is the right one. So I would say there's really a discussion about what Copenhagen means and this distinction to Neo-Copenhagen, maybe traditional one, 
makes exactly the difference. And what I was talking about implicitly um, now was the traditional one. And thanks a lot for mentioning this. So the neo one is exactly what you had in mind. Okay, then I hope this clarified the question and I will then continue. So there is a, an extension of the sort experiment that, I, that we can have proposed. And of course the extension is kind of just the, the claim that this is a statement we could in principle verify if we had very good technology. Of course, I said before that putting a, a human into a box and so on, that um, is physically doesn't maybe, I mean, we can never isolate the box perfectly, but let's suppose this agent is a more abstract system, maybe a computer who does everything that a human does. And then we could ask ourselves, could we verify the claim that there is this superposition state here. I need to briefly go back. So then this is still the superposition state. Could, could we verify it? And of course, quantum mechanics um, tells us that we can always measure the system in an arbitrary basis. So why not measure this, this whole lab consisting of Alice and, the, and, and the, this, um, the system R in a basis which contains this as one of the possible elements of the basis. And then we would have an experimental confirmation that indeed Alice remained in a superposition. Now that's of course something we could in principle do, but not in practice. But I think the, the important aspect of Deutsch's proposal is to say that this is not just a claim. So claiming that it's in a superposition is not like an empty statement that has no physical consequences. It would have physical consequences if we had the technology to carry out these measurements. And um, one could now say that even if we, and this is always about thought experiments, thought experiments are mostly about things we, that are so far from being realizable that we don't even dream of actually implementing them. But thought experiments about, are about testing whether a theory is consistent. So he said in quantum theory allows in principle these measurements. So the and the difference between these different interpretations, so whether there is here a cross or a, or a mark, this is something that is experimentally testable. This is not just a matter of, let's say, pure interpretation. It's actually a physics question. It's just we are unlucky that we don't have good enough devices to actually test it. Now, I'll um, finally come to the thought experiments I'm actually Proposed, I proposed together with Daniela Frauchig, and the thing that was mentioned at the beginning. And the idea of that sort of experiment is to find out whether the existence of such a measurement, even if we now cannot test it directly, would um, have some lead to some um, contradictory consequences. So we essentially want to make sense of such measurements and. So the assumption that goes into this sort of experiment is that such, ex such measurements exist. And then we somehow want to conclude that if they existed, we arrive at the problem. So therefore, there was possibly a problem with this basic assumption that they existed. So that's kind of the line of reason. Now, before I start, um, okay, I mean, this is just, I forgot to say that that's again, this basis in which we measure this is something to keep in mind for later, that this is what I mean by the Deutsch basis. It's a measurement with respect to this superposition state we expect this lab to be in. Now the experiment that um, we're proposing, and I, I call it now FR because that's just how in the literature is now referred to usually, is an experiment which is a bit more complicated than Wigner's original sort of experiment. It has four different players, which somehow, who all reason about other things. So for example, there is an Alice who um, doesn't only describe a system R, but she also describes, she somehow reasons um, about another agent who is here, Wigner. And for example, there's another player whom I call you, who, um, for Ursula and she reasons about this one and so on. So there's a complicated interdependence of agents thinking about each other. And the claim is now that if they all apply quantum theory, then there will be a contradiction. And this claim, of course, I mean, this is just a side remark, um, is, um, I mean, this was kind of a strong claim. I have to admit that 
quantum zero gets becomes inconsistent when we go to these large systems. And it caused a lot of reactions. So this was a pile of letters I got. I got, of course, even by a factor of 100 more emails. But maybe one of the consequent or one of the nicest remarks that I, or maybe most instructive or relevant remarks I got was the following. This was in a discussion in Scott Darlinson's blog. Someone said, I mean, remember that the type, I didn't say that the title of the paper was quantum theory cannot consistently describe the use of itself. And the comment was users of quantum theory cannot consistently dis decide what quantum theory is. And I think this is, there's a lot of truth in this because I showed before these interpretations, but in this thought experiment, you have to actually make a decision of what you believe is true. So you cannot, for example, take the Copenhagen interpretation, the old one, the, the traditional Copenhagen interpretation and say that Bob is anyway not the quantum system because then the whole thought experiment doesn't make sense because it's based kind of on the idea that any system including agents are themselves quantum systems in principle. Anyway, let's now go into a bit more detail. So the first thing I want to do, which disturbed me now, obviously, quite obviously, quite for a while, is that we always have these humans in, in the experiment. And it's, it, this makes the whole thing very vague. To ask what, what makes a human, why do you need humans in a thought experiment? Do they play a role? And I, I simply want to get rid of them for the purpose of this thought experiment and say that the thought experiment doesn't actually talk about humans, it talks about computers. So I replace all humans by computers. Why do I do that? What the, why does this make sense? Why do I choose computers? So the, the reason is essentially following. The, a computer can kind of be seen as a user of quantum theory in the sense that I can feed a computer with the formalism of quantum theory, with a description of an experiment, with the observations, and then the computer um, can make a prediction. And the prediction could be of the following form. Um, that it, the, it's now certain that a certain measurement that I'm going to do has outcome sets. Could also be a probabilistic prediction that the computer makes, but this was now, I chose now for the, this example, just a statement, a possible statement a computer could make after applying, after being fed with all this information about what quantum series, how the experiment looks like, and, and so on. So, uh, but sorry, now, Renato. Yes. We, before you go further, we have another question from yes. uh, uh, Alessandro. Uh, we will ask to unmute. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Let's see if. Uh, if they ask the question after. Yeah. Hi. hi. Uh, yes, but it actually was for the. Did you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Yes. Uh, actually, it was for the end uh, because it's uh, related to the Eisenberg principle. At ah, well, school. in that case, let's just uh, circle yeah. back to it at the end. Yeah. Yeah. That's quite all right. Okay. okay, then I'm looking forward to this question for later and I'll continue for the moment. Um, okay, so um, why did I, I mean, why do I now replace um, humans by computers for the thought experiment? What I need is the following. So I was calling the humans agents. And by an agent, I will now just mean some system that can um, serve or that can act as a user of quantum theory. This is indicated by the picture on the top of this page. So the computer has, for example, I mean, this is just for illustration purposes, the computer has the Schrödinger equation programmed in it. And it can now use that Schrödinger equation to make predictions about the quantum system. So in other words, and that's what we do today when we do computational quantum physics. We let essentially the computer use quantum theory to make predictions. However, there's a second role that a computer can have. A computer can itself be a, is itself a physical object. So this is indicated by saying that now the Schrödinger, you see the Schrödinger equation is outside. So the Schrödinger equation describes the computer, so to speak. Of course, you could now say, okay, computer is again a macroscopic object and so on. Why should it be described by a Schrödinger equation? Um, so maybe the best way to think of this is that I will not need, um, let's say, the hardware of the computer, the keyboard and all that and the screen. What I will talk about is really the computer as an information processing system. So if you like, you could um, um, say that what we need is only that 
all the information carrying degrees of freedom of a computer are correctly described by quantum theory. And now this is incidentally the case actually for quantum computers. I will not actually need quantum computers for this sort of experiment, but you can think of quantum, com I mean, one task that people who build quantum computers have to do is again to isolate the qubits of the quantum computer perfectly from the environment. So you could also say that a quantum computer is in particular a classical computer whose degrees of freedom are extremely well isolated from the whole environment. And so in that, that's what you should think of in, and when I show this picture here, that a computer can in principle be perfectly isolated and then it's closed system and um, is essentially obeys, um, is, its evolution is described by the Schrödinger equation. So it has, a computer has these two roles and this will be important because then we can do this nested reasoning that I indicated at the very beginning of the talk. So uh, this is illustrated by this slide. So it starts by saying a computer, again, like before, can of course describe a quantum system. For example, the spin particles, we feed it with a description of the spin particle and then the computer makes a statement about the spin particle. But now we could have a second computer, the green one, and the green computer regards this whole setup here on the top. So not only the spin system, but the computer as it reasons about the spin system as a big quantum system. So we feed into the green computer the description of this entire situation. And now the green computer reasons about this as a big physics experiment involving a, a green particle and a blue computer. So I think that uh, Mauricio uh, Gomez wanted a, a clarification. Maybe yes, can... please. Uh, hi, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, this is this is just a quick quick question. Uh, yes. The subject has to be micros microscopic, or uh -huh. no? I actually now don't. Okay, that's a, good, a very good point that I should also emphasize. Um, because we are asking the question whether quantum theory is applicable um, on larger scales, I for the moment don't even want to make a distinction between microscopic and macroscopic, but just assume, I mean, we will, I will just come in the next slide to an assumption where I say, let's suppose that all systems of any size are correctly described by quantum theory. And that somehow means if that was true, this assumption, this would mean that there is no, at least from a quantum perspective, no distinction between microscopic and macroscopic. So in other words, in order, I mean, for the salt experiment, I will make the assumption that everything independently of its size obeys the rules of quantum theory. And then we will arrive at the contradiction. And then we could of course go back and say, maybe this assumption was wrong and we have to make a distinction between microscopic and macroscopic. So in some way we will come back to this, but for the moment, um, I will just um, on the next slide say, let's assume that we don't need to worry about the distinction that quantum theory is universally valid. And then we will later, go back and say, oh, maybe this assumption was a bad one. Thanks. Okay, so um, I'll now come back to the salt experiment. And in this salt experiment, I, as I said, I replaced these humans by computers. So it actually looks a bit more like this. So this is actually how you should think of the salt experiment. There are different computers, four of them, and all of them are programmed with the rules of quantum theory. So we have to be very specific. Um, precise about what quantum theory means because we would we will have to program these computers with the rules of quantum theory and of course in this talk i will now not show you that to the last detail but um the idea is that each of the computers in this thought experiment also has a task like an experimenter and this is just an example i mean you don't the details are now not so relevant of course once you really want to understand uh, um, um, let's say uh, all the calculations that lead to the, the claim I make, and um, you have to go through this protocol, but I more want to give in this talk, I give a kind of flavor of how this whole thing works. So each of the computers has a task. And for example, this blue computer has the following task. You should generate a random bit, which is indicated here by this little coin, then prepare a spin particle. So this will be a preparation machine, which is um, prepared in, in either spin down direction or spin right direction, depending on what the outcome of the coin was. And then he should send the spin particle to the green computer. And also the blue computer should 
make a prediction about what the red computer will measure. So there, in order to make sense of this, I need to describe to you what the red computer measures, and I will come to that. But each computer has such a, a set of, of instructions. So it's like experimenters. I, I have four friends who have to help me in the experiments or four assistants, and I tell each of them what they have to do. And so in this case, each computer has these rules. For example, the green one has to measure the particle, the spin particle that it gets from the blue one in the up-down direction. Um, and then it has to actually make a prediction or a retrodiction rather of what the value R was of this spin, uh, of this random value. And then um, it also has to make a prediction. Um, it actually has to, again, make a prediction of what this red computer measures. Okay, I will now here not go through the details, just to say that there are additional things. And this computer, this is important, has to make, a, here the instruction is it has to make a measurement of this whole thing. And the measurement it has to do is what I called, what I am termed a bell, uh, sorry, a Deutsch measurement. So it measures the whole lab in a superposition state. Um, in the superposition state I had before. So it somehow expects that this lab is in the superposition of having seen up and down, and it, it tries to verify that. Okay, now these computers, as I said before, have to make predictions. Each of them has to make a prediction. And for that, as I said before, we have to make an assumption. This is the assumption. So now we, we will introduce assumptions, three assumptions. And if you're unhappy with any, of, with any of the three assumptions, then this is a very good thing because I will actually show, or the whole purpose of the SOT experiment is to show that one of the assumptions must have been wrong. And that will be essentially the main claim. So in some way, I make now the assumption that quantum theory is universally applicable. And that was, of course, the, the question we started off with. Now, um, with, and it, now if I, at the end, can show that one of the assumptions was wrong, then this is an indication that, indeed, quantum theory is not universally applicable. So you could even see it as an assumption by contradiction. So let's suppose it was the case that quantum theory is just applicable to any subsystem of the world, including, in particular, any computer. Now, independently of whether they are macroscopic or not, that was related to the question before. So I don't care about that. Quantum theory is just valid. And then I assume that whenever a computer makes a calculation and sees, for example, if, and this is now maybe more for those who are um, actually doing quantum theory, in quantum theory, we can very abstractly say that usually what we do is we prepare the system in a particular state, then the state undergoes a certain evolution described by unitary. And then if the system is closed and then or isolated, and then we measure it with a projective measurement. And if, for example, it happens that after applying the unitary to the quantum state, and then the projector, this thing still has norm one, then we are, we can say that the outcome of the measurement that corresponds to that particular projector occurs with probability one. So this slide just indicates that the computer does such calculations. And if it finds, it's, for example, one, he makes this statement, I'm certain that the outcome will be this, for example. But then there are other rules. Because there are different computers, we have to have some consistency rules. And what do I mean by a consistency rule? I said before that the key ingredient to this experiment is that um, this recursive use of the series. So the green computer will, for example, think about what does the blue computer predict. And so suppose that you find out that the green computer um, or suppose that the green computer finds out that the blue computer concluded that a certain measurement outcome will be set. Then, because all computers are, of course, they should be programmed all with the same rules of quantum theory. So they, um, they should, in that sense, um, be consistently programmed. But if they are consistently programmed, then it's, of course, reasonable to assume that um, the green computer has to kind of um, be able to take over that conclusion. So this is a bit, if I, for a moment, go back to real humans. If I know that, for example, Alessandro Fondrini, who is a very good quantum physicist, and let's suppose we have learned it from the same professors and what quantum theory is, that if he makes a calculation, and I come to the conclusion that the outcome of his calculation is that a certain measurement will show spin up, 
then I can also be certain myself that the spin will be up of that measurement because essentially I trust his calculations or I, I know that he applied them correctly. And that's kind of this rule. And for computers, this should be true if they're programmed correctly. So, but that's an assumption. You may also be unhappy about that assumption. And as I said before, we will show that one of them was wrong. Now the, the third rule is, you could say, of course, what should not happen is that after applying different calculation rules, you get at the contradictory statement. So if, if the computer who, who uses quantum C arrives at the, at the prediction that an outcome is set and that it's also not set, then something went wrong. So you should think of this experiment as these computers all apply these rules and then there is like an alarm bell and if one computer sees that he arrived at the conclusion of this type, which clearly doesn't make sense, he rings the alarm bell and the whole experiment stops. And he says something in our rules that we use to make conclusions have, must have been wrong. Okay, now um, comes a, just maybe for five minutes part where I want to explain how we actually arrive at this conclusion. This is a little bit more technical, but I think it's, um, I also, just want to give you a flavor of how now the argument goes without really showing all the details, because I think it's easier to just read the paper if you're really interested in the details. But I think it's, in, it's more interesting to see the conceptual things. And so I will just show an example of how the analysis goes. So I said before that the, all computers are instructed with certain things they have to do. The blue computer in particular is instructed to um, throw a toss a coin and then depending on whether it's tails or heads either prepares a particle spin right or a particle down and then the computer and, and the remember the green one is is instructed to just do a measurement in the up down direction so this is a bit like a, a weakness friend experiment and um, if i mean at least in one case there is a, a spin particle prepared in the superposition of up and down and the green one measures it in the up down basis now um of course from the i mean the, the blue computer is also instructed this was also part of the instruction set you received to make a prediction about the measurement of the red one now the red one is a bit like in deutsch's thought experiment the red one measures the whole lab here so i said before that the green one who is in this lab is a bit like the friend in Wigner's thought experiment and the red one is like Wigner or uh, who does this Deutsch measurement. And so we know that if quantum zero is correct, there will be a superposition state in this lab. So suppose that R, that this coin shows tails. And um, I should maybe remind you again that if the coin showed tails, then the instruction for the... Oh, sorry. Uh, that was wrong. The instruction for the blue computer is to prepare a superposition of up and down. So if the if we are in this case, if there's tails and there's the superposition of up and down, then we know the green computer will be in the state in the superposition between up and down. And if now the red one measures, he will just confirm that and see indeed this is the superposition state up and down. Now, this is maybe a bad um, terminology, but I, if this measurement is successful and he sees that it's a superposition between up and down, then he calls that measurement outcome fail. Uh, it's actually the thing we would expect to happen, so it's maybe strange if I call it fail, but the reason why I call it fail is that we want to execute the experiment until he once gets okay here. So this is just the terminology. But now the important thing is that the, the blue computer can make this prediction. He knows if I prepare a superposition, then the blue one, uh, the, the, the red one will get this outcome. So the blue computer has now used quantum theory to make a prediction about the measurement of the red computer. And now the interesting thing happens next. This is maybe now the conceptually most interesting part. The green computer, as I said before, is just supposed to measure up down. So suppose now that we are in the situation as before, that the blue one has, um, has um, prepared the spin um, right, uh, uh, spin in the right direction, I mean, a superposition of up and down, which he does whenever this coin is tails and has made this prediction as before. And now let's suppose the green computer gets the outcome plus one half. 
So plus one half means it's spin up. Of course, if, if this is a superposition of up and down, that's what was prepared. I mean, this is a spin to the right particle. With probability one half, he will indeed get this re result. But if he gets um, plus one half, then he can conclude that the blue computer, this randomness that was generated was tails. Why can he conclude that? The reason is that if the randomness was heads, then again, by the instructions that I showed before, the blue computer would have prepared a spin down state. But if it was a spin down state, then the green one would never have measured spin up. So if, if he measures this spin up, which is indicated by the plus one half, he knows that this R must have been tails. And then now the green computer knows what the, the blue, what the randomness of the blue one, and he can make the whole calculation that the blue one, um, one did about the outcome of the red one. So this sounds a bit complicated, but the, the picture shows this. So the green computer now simulates what the, he knows what the randomness this coin was of the blue one, and he can just do the calculation himself that the blue one did. So the green one knows that the blue one came to the conclusion that the measurement of the red one was fail. And now comes this consistency rule, which says, if you have such a situation, then the green one can just say, he's certain that the outcome of the measurement by the red one will be failed. So that's the type of steps we are doing. And as I said, I will not go through all of them. I'm just indicating that you can repeat this game for the yellow one, which was on the top. The yellow one gets a certain outcome. Based on this outcome, he can simulate what the green does. And in a certain case, he will get, um, he, will, he can conclude that the green one arrived at the conclusion that the red one will get the outcome failed. And he can again apply this consistency and say, oh, I'm actually now certain that um, the outcome of the measurement by the red one, which is the last one in the thing, will be fail. And he can tell that to the red one. So now we have a situ the following situation. The red one, before he has actually done a measurement, gets the information from the yellow computer that the outcome of the measurement has to be fail. And I didn't... As I said, I, and I only showed one step in this term, so you have to believe me that we can show the following. Whenever a certain outcome, which I label here, okay, occurs for the yellow one, the yellow one can make this prediction that um, the, the red one will observe fail. But now we can also do a direct calculation. We can just, using quantum mechanics, calculate how likely is it that the yellow one will get okay, and therefore make this prediction, but that the red one will nonetheless get the outcome okay. And the calculation shows that this will happen with a certain positive probability. Okay, now this was a bit technical, but the summary is the following. We have now sh shown that we, have, we can arrive at the following situation, that after all these computers did their reasoning, at the end of the day, we can have a situation with probability 1 12th, that the yellow computer, just by using the rules of quantum theory that we would apply, as quantum physicists, um, arrived at the conclusion that the measurement here that will be done of this value W will be, have the outcome fail. Nonetheless, it happens with probably the, uh, 112 that it will be okay. So we have this situation that the red one got the information if you measure fail with certainty, but he actually measured okay. And this is now, of course, a contradictory statement. So he, he drinks the alarm bell and says something in our reasoning rule was wrong. Okay, so to summarize, what I did is the following. I said we have a, a rel admittedly relatively complicated setup consisting of four computers who reason about each other. All of them are programmed with rules and the rules are summarized here. One rule is just apply essentially quantum zero and make predictions. Um, about what others will see. Then if you are sure that another one is sure about something, take that conclusion as your own conclusion. And the last one is just if some um, contradictory conclusions arise, ring the alarm bell and say, we have to stop. And so in this particular experiment, we know that um, there will be this contradiction arising. So in other words, these three rules taken together are not a good rule set they lead to contradictions in general. And I think this is um, really the, the, what I mean by saying that 
if you now go into this regime of macroscopic quantum mechanics or quant apply quantum mechanics to larger systems, we run into problems. Why do I say that? So rule Q is probably really the, the critical one because rule Q was that um, essentially quantum mechanics can be applied to any system. So there's no extra collapse mechanism or something macroscopic that makes macroscopic systems different from small quantum systems. So we just assumed that. Then this rule is, of course, something we probably don't want to give up because it just says that um, there should be consistency among different statements that different people make about outcomes that they could in. Um, I mean, it's not about states, it's about outcomes of, of measurements. And of course, that's also something that we probably don't want to give up. So the conclusion is really that we have, therefore, um, a problem. And I quickly go to this slide. So this is now this question mark turned into an exclamation mark. And this exclamation mark doesn't mean it's impossible that quantum theory is valid here. It just says that if we use quantum theory in the way I described it now as a theory that is valid for any other subsystem in the world. And if you have, in addition, these consistency requirements, then we run into a contradiction. Now, um, this was the conclusion that I should go back one and actually give credit to a few people, because this sort experiment that we proposed is actually a, a big combination of sort experiments that existed already in the literature, like Schrödinger's cat experiment, Wigner's friend, Salt experiment, um, also experiments proposed by Lucia Hardy and by Jaslav Bruckner. And we somehow combined all of them into one big thing, which then was quite complicated. But we need this whole combination to arrive at this conclusion that these three rules are inconsistent. Then I also want, I mean, this is essentially now the end of the talk. So I want to thank also Daniela Frauchiger, who was a co author of this um, study, and also Nuria Nur Galieva, with whom. I recently wrote an article which summarizes some of the consequences of that. So the reference is given here, testing quantum theory with sort experiments. And um, okay, with that, I also want to thank you for your attention. And I would like to just show uh, at the end, again that slide, because that's probably the thing that is up for discussion. Because the claim, as I said, to repeat is that these three rules are inconsistent with each other. Um, in the, um, where this rule, I mean, this is not written here, is of course um, including the assumption that quantum theory is applicable to any arbitrary system, including systems that can themselves apply quantum theory. Okay, thanks again for your attention. And um, I'm now looking forward to questions. Thank you very much for the nice talk, which, as I expected, was quite uh, thought-provoking, and uh, I'm sure that there will be many questions. Uh, maybe I will start with one. So one is that um, you really give us these three um, these three rules, and of course uh, it's it feels unpleasant to let go to of any of the three. Of course, we would like to have all three of them. Uh, I wonder whether. Um, could there be any sort of uh, hidden, not really pitfalls in the argument, but some other place where you could relax something, maybe something slightly more technical or something? Could you comment on that? You know, like uh, yes. how can you be quite sure that it's really these three big concepts and not something that maybe feels a little bit more technical, but can be a bit less uh, uh, problematic to, to mm -hmm. relax? Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot for this question. Um, yeah. So, um, I think actually the resolution of this whole thing will probably even go in that direction. So what I maybe can say is that I'm not aware of any other major additional assumption that goes into that. But this is not yet, I mean, this is a claim that is hard to make because some people propose to me that it's all fine to have these rules, but I, in addition, made the additional rule or assumption implicitly that logic is applicable. Now, of course, um, I could have stated as an additional rule that we are applying logic to do the whole reasoning. And, uh, but um, then, of course, it gets a bit strange because, um, of course, if you don't assume logic, it would be maybe wouldn't make much sense to even talk to each other. But indeed, I mean, if I'm strict, I would say, of course, we first need to um, 
even um, kind of agree on the logical framework that this whole thing is based on. Now, um, there are um, other things that um, people mentioned that could um, have been, um, that are assumed and um, they are sometimes a bit maybe hard to put into a statement. So for example, um, people pointed out the following, in particular those doing Bohmian mechanics, that one thing that is actually assumed is the following. So in, in the salt experiment, we are saying, depending on the outcome of the coin, the blue computer prepares a particle spin right if the coin is tails and spin down if it's heads. But now some people say, who gives you the guarantee that if you prepare a particle it's been right, that indeed it has been right? Now, okay, this is also an assumption we're making. I would claim this is a reasonable assumption by the very word of saying we prepare something in spin right. We mean that at the end it's in spin right. But actually, this is, I, I see, I understand the Bohmian perspective because in the Bohmian perspective, if you do calculations, you see that something you prepare as spin right actually from the global wave function point of view of the universe suddenly turns and is no longer a spin right. So in, in that sense, I would say um, these three assumptions that I'm mentioning are to the best of my knowledge, all the reasonable assumptions that go into that. But I could well imagine that in a few years from now, when we have a better understanding of what's going on, we will find that actually the problem was somewhere else. And I think this is an interesting direction to look into. Okay, in, in the meantime, we have quite a list of uh, questions from the chat. Uh, if that's okay, Alessandro had a question before, but I thought it, I think it's a bit more general. So maybe uh, I think that there are a couple of questions that are more sort of on this latest point. So I just want to continue this sort of train of thought. And uh, I would ask uh, Zoom to IFT, which maybe is some uh, group uh, uh, Zoom, we will find out. Uh, I think it's just a, sem a whole seminar room, probably, to ask the question. Maybe they can introduce themselves. Let's see. If they react. Well, if not, let me just uh, ask uh, Martin Green first to ask a question, uh, since uh, uh, the others are maybe a bit slower to react. So, Hi, uh, uh, Martin, please. So you can hear me clearly? Yes. OK, so a very interesting talk and, and very nicely presented. Uh, thank you. Uh, there seem to be two uh, additional assumptions here. Uh, one is that you've assumed that, that the system, a large quantum system, can be divided into subsystems and those can be, those can be separated. And uh, th there, there is no explanation given as to, as to how that might uh, occur. That's something that's done outside of the, of the quantum mechanics uh, system. So they, the assumption that there, that there do exist some systems that are separable is, is, is a very important assumption to the, to the whole argument. Uh, the other uh, assumption is that having done that, having defined subsystems, that each of the subsystems would somehow be aware of the space-time geometry, would have a, a notion of time and a notion of space and a notion of direction uh, in space, which are all uh, mutually compatible with each other. Now, in general, uh, I know of no means to separate any experiment, any subsystem from the background geometry, but neither does quantum mechanics uh, provide uh, any justification whatsoever for associating operators X and P uh, with particular directions in space-time geometry. So those are underlying assumptions that seem to not be addressed by quantum mechanics or, or by uh, the the approach of, of using subsystems yes thanks a lot for for this comment um i mean my short answer would be i completely agree with what you said maybe a slightly more extended answer is that the subdivision into subsystems 
um, is something I usually see, but this is only a, a, a question of terminology as part of the assumption that we have quantum theory, but here I may be too much a quantum information theorist, because if you read usually how quantum information theorists um, phrase the postulates of quantum mechanics, then the fact that we can subdivide um, systems into subsystems is part of this postulate. But having said this, I agree that this is something that is highly problematic. And um, I could well imagine that, uh, that this is another, or maybe even a promising route towards resolving um, this problem. And um, what you said at your second, or your second point, um, this, um, I mean, whether, I mean, okay, the question is also where is this now occurring in my framework? Because in the framework, um, when I say, what do I mean? I mean, I didn't present that in the talk, but when I um, describe in the paper, what do I mean by quantum mechanics? Then it also includes the fact that we have a well-defined unitary that we understand. And then when we apply the unitary, the system is in a well-defined state. So in that sense, the assumption that there is kind of a time reference is also within my presentations in the paper and so on, part of the assumption that quantum mechanics is valid. But here again, I agree that this is a strong assumption. And I'm actually myself um, currently um, involved in a research program where we try to explore that more and see to what extent can we actually make this assumption. And this has to do with the question of reference frames, for example. There is some very interesting recent work by several people, for example, the group of Jaslav Bruckner among them about quantum reference frames. And I could well imagine that understanding this better could give us a hint on, on what this assumption meant. But yes, in short, I agree with this, all these points. Thank you. So I think that now uh, the uh, okay. EFD. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Renato, for this nice talk. Uh, I would like to ask you one question and then one comment. The question is, uh, is a causality is assumed in this protocol? Causality, um, uh, I would say it depends on how you define it. So the usual notion of causality and um, that we are using, for example, when we talk about Bell type experiments and so on, um, invokes a choice made by someone. Now here in this experiment, there is no kind of external choice. Of course, you could say there's this random coin that is just here on the slide and depending on the outcome of that coin, something happens. But at the end, that's just essentially a, a process I could describe with a unitary. So we don't, unlike in a Bell type experiment, we don't say that there is kind of an external choice. And of course, if I have no external choice that is made to the experiment, it's hard to kind of even distinguish um, like um, cause and effect. So in this experiment, it's really something that uh, if I repeat it, it would always, I would always repeat it in exactly the same way. And there's no randomness fed into it and therefore no choice. So, the, you, so that's all to say that the notion of causality that is used in Bell type theorems is not used here. Of course, there are many other notions of causality and I wouldn't um, now try to make a statement that causality plays no role, but not that type of causality that we use in Bell type experiments. I see. Okay, thanks. So, con concerning the beginning of the talk, you were saying that the microscopic uh, systems, quantum mechanics is uh, right, it works. Mm -hmm. And then as you go on, well, it seems that there is an intermediate region where we don't really know. And then finally, you go, you go to the black holes, indeed, there you, we don't know. It also depends on quantum gravity. But what about the, mm -hmm. the results, uh, let's say, concerning the microscopic uh, background fluctuations. There, people have used uh, quantum mechanics to predict this fluctuation, how the galaxies emerge. But mm -hmm. probably at that level, you can also say that quantum mechanics is working, right? At least semi-classically to some level, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I I mean, and maybe the fir first thing I should say is that the SOLT experiment really takes place already in this regime. So it's not a SOLT experiment that in any way talks about gravity. Nonetheless, of course, this question is very interesting, how, what happens in this regime? And of course, if we all, I mean, suppose that we already have a problem here. So if you think, um, let's say, I mean, 
whether you call it a problem or not depends on what you think about the assumptions. But um, any problem we have here will, of course, also exist here, which doesn't, however, imply that quantum mechanics um, makes no correct statements here at all. It just, you see, the situation I kind of created to get this contradictory situation is an extremely involved one. It's a very particular um, constellation of different systems reasoning about each other. And one could, for example, reasonably assume that natural situations that we have are not subject to this problem. So that it's more a problem that doesn't have to do with size, but rather of the complexity of the setup. And that, so it could, for example, be that actually quantum mechanics works very well when we describe micro or a microwave background, um, or the microwave background, but doesn't work well when we um, describe systems which have a high computational complexity, for example. That could be. So by no means I want to claim that there is, like if there's a problem here, we cannot use quantum mechanics here, but we, we have to be careful. And for example, I mean, I was mentioning this black hole information paradox. There, we really have to be careful because there it's much more similar to the type of um, situation I'm considering. I mean, there people are considering throwing someone into a black hole and then retrieving information from that person. That's very similar to what I did. So I would say, if we have already a problem here without gravity, then we have to be very careful to take the conclusions from black hole information paradox series without first resolving the problem without gravity, because there we're really talking about agents and so on potentially. But still, I'm myself very much interested in, in research that goes on here. And I think um, if there is a problem with quantum mechanics, it's more a problem on the um, like side that we are probably using, um, generally when we are applying quantum mechanics, implicitly making the assumption that the system from whose viewpoint I describe another small system is kind of large, serves as a big reference. So I always have the implicit assumption that I myself, as a user of the theory, big reference. If I was myself a system with a big uncertainty, I would see the world differently. So maybe some of the statements that are problematic here are just um, problematic because the agents are themselves kind of subject to quantum mechanics. And this is not generally what we have if you look at, um, let's say, known I mean, known current research about fluctuations here. Okay, this was a, a bit of a vague answer, but I just want to make clear that I don't think now it's useless to study quantum mechanics here, quite the opposite. Okay. I think it's okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think that next, uh, maybe we're also going back a bit in the direction of that question. Uh, and we could ask uh, Alessandro Spallici to ask his question since he has been very kind and waited. Uh, so long. Let's see if he's there. Well, maybe if he's not there quite yet, I will ask Augusto then to ask a question. Let's see. Hi, this is Augusto from Florence. Hi. So, uh, the first uh, step in your Jedankin experiment is the statement that Alice gets down and then she can make a, a statement about Wigner getting fail with certainty, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But how are we sure that uh, uh, Alice can make that statement? And the reason is the following. From her perspective, she gets down and then of course, from this point of view, everything follows. Wigner should get fail. But she is also aware that this is a superposition of state where Alice get down plus Alice get up. And this is what actually Wigner see as an all wave function. Mm -hmm. So maybe she will should say, I certain, I mean, I'm certain that uh, I got down and Wigner get fail only if my friend will not rotate the state, mixing up the fact that I measured down and measured up. Because mm -hmm. uh, the whole contradiction comes from the fact that the friend of Alice makes this rotation in space somehow, in the Eber space, and this rise the contradiction. 
but she's aware of that. She's aware that a vegan can do that. So maybe she cannot really make the certainty, I mean, this, uh, you know, this uh, statement with full certainty without this caveat. Yes. Okay, thanks for this question. This is a, actually a concern that was in a similar form also raised by Scott Arnson um, shortly after this experiment came out. And um, he, he wrote this blog with the title that hot amarted agents cannot make predictions or something like that. So I think he meant something very similar to what you meant. So let me briefly explain what, um, yes, what, how I see this. Um, so the concern, if I understand your question correctly, is the following. This is, let's say, Alice, she, I mean, it's now a computer, but this is Alice, she makes a prediction about what happens here. And now the concern is essentially that this yellow measurement of Alice will of course somehow screw up Alice's state. And I mean, we don't even know what, I mean, if you do, this is a highly destructive measurement, this Deutsch type, this is a, a measurement in this, what I call Deutsch basis. This will certainly screw up this thing completely. And now I think um, what also, for example, Scott Aronson said is that, okay, this person, or if it was a person or this computer could make a prediction about the red one, but this prediction can only be valid if we are sure that this blue computer is not going to be measured by a yellow one. Um, so the yellow one will essentially disturb the prediction in some way. And um, so this, um, I mean, this is somehow um, part of, I mean, okay, technically in our argument, it's again the assumption about quantum theory, because in quantum theory, we just say quantum theory tells us we can make a prediction. And if I make a prediction, I don't have to worry what happens with me who made the prediction, because I'm just the guy making the prediction. Now, and what you're saying could be right, but then one would have to add a rule to quantum theory telling us under which conditions can we actually in a, in a um, let's say sound way make predictions. And, and the condition would, for example, say, if I make a prediction about what you are going to measure tomorrow, but now someone comes along and measures me, then the prediction may have been wrong. So one thing to notice here is, of course, if someone now measures me, then I don't know any longer what prediction I made because maybe this measurement destroyed my own memory. But this is not the issue here because the whole point of the experiment is that, um, I mean, you notice this here, probably that the green computer, um, after this step, let me go to that. The green computer knows what the blue one predicted um, before the blue one is going to be measured. So now, the green one essentially knows what happened, and now one can measure the blue one, and we still know what the blue one predicted. So that's not the issue that the memory content gets lost, but you could say still, even if we know what the, the, the blue one predicted, if we now measure the blue one, that could somehow alter the fact that this prediction is valid. And that's, by the way, also a conclusion from Bohmian mechanics that uh, um, which very can show that even explicitly happens that if you measure this computer, suddenly other things change. This is actually by the non-locality of Fermian mechanics that this happens. So this is, in that sense, a very, uh, a very reasonable um, thing to say. And um, the problem is a bit, I mean, okay, you could say that's, that could be a reason not to believe in the assumption Q that I mentioned. I mean, that could be just a conclusion. You could say, actually, that's indeed what this experiment shows. It shows that if you're not careful enough and, and don't include the criterion, when are our predictions valid? then um, we run into problems. And now, of course, my question back would, would be, how would you now correct assumption Q? And there's the following problem. You could say, okay, I could of course try to find out whether someone later measures me, but um, the problem with that is that um, in order to make such a statement, I would always need to know essentially in Bohmian terms, um, the state of the whole universe, so to speak. So I could only make predictions if I kind of took an outside perspective, could call it God's perspective and do calculations there. And there I would see what is rotated and what not. And then I would not, so if, if it was true that the true thing is really what happens from as seen from the outside, there's a state of the universe. And then um, I think the, the problem 
um, would not arise. But um, we are not able to know that state. So if I, for example, now prepare a spin up and send it to you, maybe I made a random decision of whether I sent you a spin up or a spin down. So maybe from the outside views point, or let me be more concrete because this is important. So let's suppose I have a, a, a random number generator. And now I send you, um, I, depending on the outcome, if I get a zero, I send you a spin down state. If it's a one, I send you a spin up state. Now, I want, of course, to make the statement that if I send you a spin up state, then indeed you will get the spin up state. Now, according to this outside perspective, I shouldn't make this claim. I should just say that oh, from the out, viewed from the outside, there is um, a superposition of me preparing a down state and an up state. And actually, you will measure either of them. But if you make, if you take this very consequently, if you make this very, I mean, if you do this to the end, we will never be able to make any prediction. So that could be a conclusion of, of this sort of experiment that we say we should really have to do that. But I wouldn't be very happy with it because it was essentially disallow us to do um, to make predictions because um, we are all now we are probably in a huge superposition state. We are probably in a superposition. In one branch, I give this talk, in another one, not. In one, I give it, and you are not in the audience, and vice versa. And now I couldn't make any statement at all. So, usually, when we make statements, we want to make statements conditioned on the information I have. And I think all this is about including the information I have and not only talking about the average of what happens, so to speak. Can I comment briefly on this? Yes, I don't mind if you comment. Yes, sure. Uh, I think that the, the prediction would be, from a point of view of Alice, I'm certain that that uh, beginner will fail unless somebody, I'm macroscopic because I'm doing mm -hmm. some, uh, mm -hmm. unless somebody will put me in a superposition, I'm already in superposition, but will rotate mm -hmm. this macroscopic state. Unless, Somebody mm -hmm. does it, but if nobody rotate the state, all my conclusion will be consistent and they will go on according to the usual rules. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, of course, from a microscopic point of view, we don't observe this and we forget to make this assumption for all practical mm -hmm. purposes. Mm -hmm. Nobody will rotate us, right? Mm -hmm. So we just assume that whatever we decide yeah. we can claim will be just consistent with something else. Mm -hmm. But if some super uh, human mm -hmm. will rotate us, then it might do, then we have to take in consideration that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I, I agree with this, but I, I see it a bit differently. I would say that, um, yes, you're absolutely right in what you're saying. This is a possible solution. So the solution would be that um, the rule Q that I called Q should be changed. And if I, for example, make a prediction that you will see spin up, then the rule is always conditional that no one comes and measures me in a very strange basis. Um, so, I mean, this is technically correct. So with that addition, we avoid the paradox. Now, as a physicist, let's say I'm not very happy with this change of the rule. I mean, of course, you, you would say this is really always has been the correct rule and we are just forgetting it. But of course, that's, I think, just one possible view because you could also view it from a different side and say all the experiments we ever did were experiments where we, I mean, the experiment, the very experiments that led to quantum mechanics were experiments where I prepared something and someone measured it. And um, we, we didn't have experiments where someone came and measured me. So we simply don't know what happens there. But all our, so what you are actually doing is saying we did experiments which locally were correct. And then we somehow said, yes, that's fine. But actually the real true thing is what would have happened if we did these experiments with the whole world and assign a quantum state of the whole world. And that's the true thing. And, and we have to always go back to this big quantum state of the world. So that's a big step to make to say, because we develop the theory only locally. This is kind of making the step at the first, at a very early stage, we develop a theory which is microscopically true. And then we say, but actually the really true thing in a situation which is maybe doubtful, we have to look at the whole universe. But I agree that if you do that step, I just question that step, but if you do it, then I would completely agree with what you're saying. So uh, there have been a couple of more questions in the chat mm -hmm. that I wanted to bring up. Yes. Uh, I'll just re read them uh, with the names of the people that asked it. Leonardo Bianchi was wondering whether your results 
imply some no-go theorem for the development of fault-tolerant quantum computers or other complex quantum devices. That's one question. And another question, refer, referring to something that you also mentioned, uh, uh, Janusz Kluza was saying that um, I got the impression that your results are like a variant of Gödel's theorem on non-consistency of theorems according to logic and given axioms. Whether you see any kind of connection there. Yes. Okay. These are really excellent questions. So for the first about whether it, it implies a bound on, on I, I think the more general way one could phrase it is that um, maybe in the spirit of how I motivated the talk that if you now want to build big quantum computers, you're so, somehow moving to the right of this, um, of this um, diagram into more large and larger systems. And of course, the point of my experiment is that we have somewhere um, potentially a problem here. As I said, I say potentially, it depends on these assumptions, which are of course up to discussion. And I think the, the first, I mean, for me, I would say I, I wouldn't call it a no go theorem because I think it's very likely that um, the resolution as we discussed before is maybe somewhere in an assumption that is somehow in between the lines or as was asked before, maybe somewhere in what is the reference for time and space, can we even separate subsystems? And this will not have much to do with computers. Nonetheless, the fact that we build computers is in some way a good test to exclude certain possibilities, because indeed one possibility, one possible conclusion from my thought experiment is that um, simply there's maybe a, a collapse mechanism when we go to large systems. And that's the reason why we now seem to have inconsistency. And building a big computer would essentially be an experimental confirmation that we don't have that. So I wouldn't um, call it a no-go theorem because um, there are many possible ways out, but I think whatever the way out is, it will be a very interesting way out. And therefore I would say, I, my expectation is that we can build big full tolerant quantum computers without problems that will not be inhibited by that, but we will probably learn that the problem in this that led to the contradiction is somewhere else. And of course, um, this could even be what we just what I just said in the question to the in the answer to the previous question that we really have to understand quantum mechanics as something that is conditional on whether someone does measurements on us. That would be, in my opinion, a bit surprising, but that's possible. But um, it could also be something much more mundane that we somehow have to include the fact that reference systems are themselves quantum mechanical and we didn't do that maybe properly with, in our current formalism. So, no, I don't see it as a no go theorem. The other question about the Gödel, I actually have a slide prepared because that always comes up. And the slide is this one. So, I think it's kind of an opposite of Gödel theorem. So, I, I mean, what does this mean? Gödel's, I mean, of course, as is well known somehow, um, okay, I should explain the formalism, but this means it's not. Um, so we, we know that um, if you have a formalism F, a formal system, then the formalism cannot prove the consistency of the formalism itself. So it's essentially proof that this statement that F can prove the consistency is not true. Now here, this is really kind of the opposite. We have a formalism and add to this formalism certain assumptions, Q, C, and S, and then we are saying, um, we can, within that for extended formalism, which um, includes the assumptions, we can prove that we have an inconsistency. So that would be my answer. So I leave the slide maybe for a moment, but uh, I think this slide really shows that it's somehow in a similar spirit, it's about the consistency, but it's also in some other way, the opposite. Okay. I think that there is, uh, by the way, uh, Thank you very much for, ask, uh, for answering so exhaustively all the questions. Uh, I think okay. everybody is appreciating it a lot. I think there is a, another question of, uh, from uh, Lorenzo Maccone. Let me unmute him. He can ask it himself. Okay. Um, I, I, I just wanted to ask about uh, what happens in the relational quantum mechanics and in, uh, in the relative state interpretation. I guess in that case, you can uh, drop the assumption that everybody should agree. I mean, the consistency assumption, right? Because yes, in relational... Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, that's exactly the case. So I actually discussed this 
with people <laughs> that are promoting these um, these interpretations. Actually, I also talked at some point to Carlo Rovelli and also Chris Fuchs, who is um, behind Cubism. And yes, Chris Fuchs has even written a paper together with one of his students about this very question that you're asking. And his conclusion is indeed that the assumption that I call C, the consistency assumption has to be changed. And I mean, maybe just related to the questions that came up before. So it sounds a bit um, like the questions that came before were more, I would say, from a Bohmian perspective. And there one tends more towards giving up the assumption Q. Now, the assumption that I called Q, that quantum mechanics can be applied to any other subsystem from the perspective of an agent, is, of course, exactly the, the starting point of all these relative, I mean, of relational quantum mechanics and of Q. Right. So they very much subscribe to Q and say, of course, um, yes. quantum mechanics has to be that. So therefore, we have to give, have to give up C the consistency assumption they, they would yeah, say it makes sense because in a relational case uh, it's uh, you have to stabilize you, you have to establish a reference and the, the reference of one computer or one yeah. of alice it's, is different from the reference of bob uh, or wigner mm -hmm. and so on so i mean it makes sense to drop that assumption yes so if i may make a comment uh, which is more of a social nature so sure. actually, all these people who are promoting interpretations of quantum theory um, are usually seeing this thought experiment as a confirmation that their interpretation is kind of the, on the right track. So for example, um, those people who are in booming mechanics say, oh, this again proves what we already knew, namely that quantum uh, mechanics as seen from the viewpoints of observers is not correct. We have to have this global right. state. And then of course, Chris Fuchs and, and, um, would say, no, we always knew it has to be relative and we generally cannot have consistency between different things. And that's exactly what it proves. So you see, it's somehow interesting that it shows that, um, so, I mean, depending on which, what conclusion you now draw, which of the three assumptions you deem to be the problematic one, you can see it as a support for either of the interpretations that are there. Sure. Well, the, the important thing is that it does not bring a contradiction to your own interpretation. Yes, I even had actually as, a slide as you were saying at yes. the beginning. Yeah. Yes, here you see actually okay. an overview you. of the different um, interpretations and what they would say is wrong or correct. And so. Okay, I see. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Very nice talk. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I don't see any more questions right now. I'd like to remind people uh, and also people that might be watching the recording later that there is a possibility of submitting a question on the GGI website. There is a form and then we will forward these questions to Renato. So so he can maybe respond at a later moment if people watch the talk and come up with some uh, doubt or, well, thought-provoking idea. I'm sure that that would be uh, quite likely given how, how lively the discussion was. So I think that uh, this was really, really nice about the talk and especially the very nice discussion that followed. I think that uh, I'm very grateful to Renato for uh, well, answering in such a detailed and comprehensive way all the questions. Uh, I'm very uh, thankful for that. So thank you all for, uh, uh, for coming and for asking these nice questions. And I think that with this, perhaps we can stop the formal part of the talk and stop the recording.